or just grab me by his throat, choking for a good 10, 12 seconds, and he'll come around. Many new inmates don't realize their prey until it's too late. For inexperienced newcomer Scott Crendel, he knows just enough to be worried. It's his first week here. It's scary at first, just expecting the unknown. It's like walking into school for the first time, like in, to, into high school or something like that. High school is the world Crandall left behind. Just two years ago, he was in 10th grade, an ordinary kid from a good home. One night in December of 2004, his life drastically changed. It started when Crandall accidentally rear-ended a car. Angry, one of the car's passengers punched him and then sped away. Crandall chased him, pushing the other vehicle off the road and into a telephone pole. The crash injured a pregnant passenger in the other car and she miscarried her baby. Crandall was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to seven years. Now he has to figure out how to live and survive as an inmate. Unlike many of the prisoners, Crandall's not violent, street smart, or strong. Three strikes against him as he tries to make his way in a criminal world. All that stands between him and veteran convicts is the institution. Ernie Moore is warden of Lebanon. He's roaming the cell blocks, doing his best to keep the inmates safe from one another. How's it going? I'm ready to go to the shower, sir. All right. A knife is a daily weapon. It's not easy. A knife is a daily weapon. And I'm not saying I'm a good guy, but the guy got caught with a knife, man, was literally trying to kill me. I got inmates here that have committed aggravated murder that have murdered more than one person, serious sex offenders that have raped uh, multiple women. Um, I've got guys in here that have kidnapped people, heavy hitter drug traffickers. I've got guys in here that uh, have assaulted, seriously assaulted staff, um, seriously assaulted children. Controlling hundreds of violent men is a daily challenge. Lebanon is a well-run prison but a recent stabbing and escape attempt have put everyone on edge. Still, staff try hard to rehabilitate inmates through various programs, including work in a license plate plant that makes all of Ohio's plates. We need to work with these guys because 80 or 90 percent of the inmates, even here at Lebanon, are someday going to be back out in society. But many inmates don't care about their future and rehabilitation. They care about the here and now. To make their lives more comfortable, they'll steal from whomever they can. Many new inmates fall prey to exploitation through activities that seem harmless. Gambling, borrowing, even accepting gifts can put them in another's debt. Crandall will have to quickly learn these unwritten rules or risk losing what safety he has left. I hope something good comes out of this that I can actually keep going. I just hope it, it all turns out all right in the end, but right now, I don't know. In addition to criminals who would shake him down for money, there are also sexual predators within these walls. Crandall doesn't know it, but even his own cellmate is a serial sex offender. In prison, there are the predators, there are the prey. And there are the staff that try to keep them separate. jobs are as dangerous as this one. In 1993, inmates rioted against the staff of one Ohio prison, killing one guard 
and taking 12 others hostage. When staff are attacked at Lebanon, the inmates are brought to a special segregation unit. This is it. Welcome to the hole. If Lebanon is a city made of criminals, then this is the neighborhood no one wants to call home. Yeah, right. this, this young man right here said this is the slums. He said the food is cold, which is I guess is different in population. Yeah, see, he said it's dirty compared. <laughs> and that's real. See, you hear what he said? And that's real. He's being real. Um, you know what this would be? This would be the part of the city that nobody cares about. That when you get off the highway here and you say to yourself, uh-oh, I got off at the wrong exit. <laughs> That's what part of the city the whole is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's different. It just, you know when you come in here, there's something different going on. That's right, baby, that's right. Sanford Whitlow has worked at the prison as a corrections officer, or CO, for 12 years. COs are probably the lowest form of law enforcement that everybody ever recognizes. They forget about you, but you're unsung heroes because you deal with all the people the world wants to forget about. Nobody want to talk about the truth. The guy who raped the kids and molested the kids over and over again, he thought about that. So now I got to deal with this guy every day, and I'm supposed to remain 100% professional, and he's supposed to be 100% and we're supposed to get along. He's supposed to follow the rules. He don't care about the rules. So you got to take it to the edge on them a lot of times. But not all officers can stand up to the pressure. The convicts single them out for harassment and abuse. 23-year-old Justin Johnson will soon find out if he can cut it. Fresh from college with a degree in criminal science, he's about to be sworn in as one of Lebanon's newest officers. Johnson's considering a career with the FBI. He figures prison is a great place to study the criminal mind. I'm doing something good, you know. Society, really, they don't want these people around. That's why they're in prison. They've committed crimes. I keep them here. Officer Johnson, welcome aboard. Thank you. You have a set of cuffs. Thank you. But Johnson's enthusiasm for the job does little to calm his nerves as he walks in. And some days you're a little nervous walking in. I mean, at first, when you first start, you're really, you know, you're nervous because you never know what you're going to expect in this place. And that's why every every day is always a little different. Every day brings a new challenge. So you always got to be on top of your game. It's 5 p.m. on E-Block. Johnson must now direct hundreds of hardened criminals. His uniform doesn't give them their respect. That's something he has to earn. You gonna take a shower? Where's your stuff? You ain't taking it. All right, get wet. Get wet. Almost immediately, the inmates start to test him. What do you want? Say he just walked by with his mouth shut, like he's scared or something. He usually don't too much say nothing. He, he, don't, he don't do none of that. He putting on the show today. These men are deadly, and this battle of wills is not a game. All right, so keep your head in your door, all right? Huh? Keep your head in your door. My head in door. Huh? Inmates, especially gang members like Derricus Albert, have much to gain by undermining Johnson's authority. When a new CO come in, we judge him just by he look. If he look all soft and sweet voice, he like, oh, we got one. We're going to have our way with him. A uh, CO like Johnson, the way he's smooth cut, and that's why most people don't respect him because of the way he look and the way he act. Once you let a person, an inmate run over you, CO don't get no respect nowhere. It's we we'll get a signal to our homies, like, yeah, he cool, F him. We're going to do what we want to do. Gangs try to manipulate weak guards through intimidation and extortion. 
Officers have even been forced into service running drugs. If he wants to work this beat, Johnson can't back down. Hey, uh, where are you going? They're definitely testing me a lot more, being new. They yell at you, they cuss at you. You know, it is hard, you know, you're running around, you're trying to maintain the order. You're trying to do a whole, a whole lot of things at one time. And sometimes it, it does get a little overwhelming. Do me a favor, keep your head in your door. All right. Put your hands in your doors. More, get your head in your door. And the numbers are against him. E-Block has 220 prisoners and just two guards. The balance of power can quickly shift. Inmates have attacked five officers at Lebanon in the past year. And just a few weeks ago, an inmate battered a female officer on cell block duty at a nearby prison. What's up, Johnson carries the same protective gear she did. This right here is my spiders, my spider alarm, spider alarm, or my man down. This is uh, if I get into trouble, if there's a fight, I need assistance. I can pull this cord right here, and it'll tell you where the officer is, and that notifies all the other corrections officers, so they come running for your assistance. It's a PR 24. He's 24 inches long, 24 ounces. Not a lot of prisons in Ohio carry these. This is what stands between me and an inmate if they come rushing at me. Scott Crandall is also feeling the pressures of his new home. It's the start of his third week. He's enrolled in GED classes, but they're not providing him the information he really needs, knowing whom to trust. In addition to the gangsters, he worries about sexual predators. As a younger guy, you gotta watch out for the, like there's a lot of people in here that are in here for some really bad crimes, like you know, sexual, sexual offenders and stuff in here, so you kinda gotta, gotta kinda watch out for them, because they look at you as a really easy target. In prison, inmates are deprived of female company for years at a time. Some turn to other men for sex and take it by force. Young, baby-faced men are a preferred choice for assault. In a controversial study, one in five inmates reported they'd been sexually victimized behind bars. Crandall has to watch out for convicts trying to pressure him for sex or extort him for money. It's 4 p.m. The cellmate, called a cellie, returns from his prison job and coaches him on prison rules. But it helped me having a celly that showed me a lot of things. Because when I first got here, I was just like you. Just like you, now you had me. When you come in here and you lucked out, because you could have had one of them crazy <laughs> as a celly. But you lucked out and got me. He's been trying to win Crandall's trust since he arrived. We're cellies. I'm going to look out for you and watch your back, and you do the same for me. And that's the way Sally should be, if you can get two people... To a more experienced inmate, the behavior might look like a trap, but not to Crandall. If I had the Sally pushes him to buy a TV set and have his family send money. That's why your mom helping you, I'm trying to point you in the right direction to do what you got to do to make sure you got that stuff. So that you're not in the same situation by not doing it while you got the chance that I was in when I got here. At this point, Crandall needs him. All right, getting ready to go to chow, right? It's dinner time. Where are they at? Bogies tonight. Hundreds of convicts converge in the cafeteria, making it a prime spot for violence. Dining alone could make Crandall a target. The celly explains that in prison, even eating has a hierarchy. I won't break bread with nobody that's black. Have not, will not. I'll socialize with them. When it comes to dinner time, I'm sitting with the white boys. Inmates segregate by color. And also by seniority and status. The toughest guys sit closest to the food line. The weakest 
closest to the guards. Even though Crandall's eating with his cellmate for protection, everyone checks the new inmate out. Sooner or later, Crandall will have to stand on his own and prove he can fend for himself. In prison lingo, inmates are prey. And predators are convicts. For you to call yourself a convict, you gotta be penitentiary orientated. Does that mean know what you're dealing with from top to bottom? <laughs> Twin, got him. I watch his everything. And I got people that watch for me too, so. If I miss something, they'll catch it. Just four weeks ago, the Crips stabbed an inmate who tried to get out from under their control. Paroled inmate Moore. Moore willingly gave his name and date of birth and advised this writer to watch her back. Now, Warden Moore and his staff are watching them closely. I, I do know inmate Albert. Albert is uh, recognized and we have him profiled as the leader of Crips at this prison. To stop Albert, the staff has to catch him breaking a rule. And that's hard to do. Typically, when you have a gang leader in a prison, very seldom do they get themselves in a position where they can be um, found guilty of some kind of rule violation. But the, the danger that they pose is the amount of respect or, for lack of a better term, authority that other inmates perceive them to have. Recently, the staff scoured the prison for weapons. They discovered hidden materials to make knives. Right? Attacks have been on the rise across Ohio, and the warden is anxious to keep his prison safe. Now, he has just learned from a national agency that Crips across the country are planning riots. There's no time to waste. He calls for a shakedown. Tomorrow, members of the state's special response team will descend on Lebanon and turn it inside out. It's 7 a.m. at Lebanon Prison. 150 members of Ohio's Special Response Team, or SRT, flood through the front door. They're here to search top to bottom for weapons, drugs, and illegal goods. In Ohio, shakedowns only happen once every couple of years. It's a good thing. I mean, it's healthy for institutions to do this. To, to make sure that there's no weapons out there, to make sure your staff's safe. The operation is run by outside teams and kept secret even from prison staff so that inmates have no advance warning. Squads of 28 officers take over each cell block. With this many men, it will take about three hours to search the area. As they enter, a strange noise gurgles up. It's the sound of dozens of toilets flushing at once. Every officer knows what it means. The prisoners are dumping their contraband. Taking the, uh, looks like it's on the even side. Coming out and marking them. Drop them over the range and we'll work our way down. Going in, going in, watch. Officer Justin Johnson helps the SRT. First shakedown, I don't think it happens very often actually, so pretty nice to be involved in it. But Johnson struggles to assert his authority. Step back, step back, stand up. Get off your bunk, stand on the ground. We'll get him, we'll get him. Hey. Now. Come on. 
two-man teams search each cell. They strip the inmates naked. All right, gentlemen, I need to stand up one at a time, take your clothes off, we'll do a routine strip search here. Hand me everything you want to come out of the cell wearing. The SRT dissect the cells, peering in bedposts, opening grates, and inspecting every item for hidden contraband. What are we looking for? Uh, weapons, drugs. Let's talk about gang paraphernalia. Major contraband. Even everyday items can become weapons. What we found here was uh, a bunch of painkiller Motrin 800 AD. This can also be used as a weapon to hit somebody. After the first wave of officers, a second special unit sweeps through. They're a gang investigation team, and they comb the cells for evidence of gang activity. It looks like Letters and symbols hidden in artwork tip them off. Anything that's related to a specific group. It's taken, we take it as contraband, and then we can profile the individual if we have enough information. They're using the shakedown to create a database of every suspected gang member at Lebanon. Gang tattoos and branding give most of them away. Some of these men have joined gangs once in prison to gain protection and power. Dyrikis Albert seems unconcerned about both the gang and weapon search. Basically every shakedown they don't find no weapons. It's easy to hide knives. The institution is too big and there's also it's too many items and it's too easy to make a knife. Scott Crandall and his cellmate are next to be searched. They told us to take all the stuff off our beds, take the sheets and everything off our beds, shake them out. They took our mats to have them x-rayed. Any and every hiding place is examined. This mattress concealed a tattoo gun, probably used to mark gang members. And a homemade screwdriver. It was inside the mattress. Good job. Did you pick it up, Bradley, on the machine? Good job. And that's not all that's found. After 10 hours of exhaustive searching, the SRT have identified almost 100 new gang members and confiscated a small but sinister stash of contraband. From the menacing. He used to wrap up tight, come up behind somebody, and make a, a real nice choke tool. To the ingenious, hollow highlighters that are used to hold blades. They got a nice handle that fits comfortably in the hand. They've tightened it up so that it doesn't slip and slide, fits snugly, and you have the makings of a, a very nice shank, something that could certainly kill somebody. But remarkably, no actual knives are found. The biggest challenge for the prison isn't confiscating the weapons, it's stopping the criminal mind. And to stop it, first you have to understand it. Hey, Officer hey, Johnson hey, uses a conversation with Dyrikis Albert to get a closer look at how the Crip leader thinks. What are you going to do when you get out? Same thing. Same thing? I refuse to be a deadbeat dad. And I'd rather die trying to feed my son than not trying to feed Damn. I learned a whole lot. I mean, just talking with them, just their, seems like their minds are totally different. They, uh, they just think different than you and I. You know, why buy food when you can steal food? That's their thought. Crime is what they know. That's what they do. But Albert has his own reasons for talking to Johnson. If he can gain the officer's trust, he might have more leeway to run his criminal enterprise. You study him. You take a CO and get to talking to him. You see what he like. So it's basically about the money. So we're not going to put a little... A CEO in front of our money. We got to make money. The gangsters started this. They don't. They don't say that, and that's the main thing. 
is they just make the world go round. And it's true. The governor, the, the, the president, they got something to do with all that. I don't, I don't know about that. And they did do it. <laughs> Johnson knows Albert probably has an agenda. But then, he hears something he doesn't expect from the leader of the Crips. The uh, dude I killed, his mom supposed to come see me. And we supposed to talk about it and stuff. He reveals that a year ago, he agreed to participate in a program that allows victims to confront the criminals that hurt them. And I'm not doing this for my health. I'm doing this for you to give you closure yeah. so you more your son better, but you sitting here throwing. Albert's motivation is unclear, but meeting the mother of the man he killed will prove much harder than he thinks. In the four weeks since his arrival at Lebanon, little has changed for Scott Crandall. He's yet to become one of them. They're making fun of you bad, Holmes. His cellmate is his one and only friend. Crandall's slow to reach out to others in prison. He's still focused on his old life. Under pressure from his celly, he's agreed to buy a TV set, and his mother's been sending money. She's helped me through all this. She's trying her hardest to take care of everything for me. My mom's just the best person in the world for me. There's, there's nobody better, really. Today, Crandall gets to see her. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's looking forward to news from home. He don't like me helping him with his homework. He wants you back home so you can help him with his homework. I like to hear what's going on, just the little things that people usually look over when they're on the outside. I like to hear that kind of stuff. It really doesn't matter what. Kind of hurts a lot more than I'm missing out on it. He keeps giving me kisses and he sticks to me everywhere I go. Cheech goes crazy. His mother's light stories are a sharp contrast to prison. Crandall's stories are from a very different world. I'm alive against for all, so not all of them, but most of the people who are in here for murder and stuff like that. My block's not exactly the best block here. I think it's probably the worst block here. His life has changed, and Crandall has to change along with it. Everybody out there that doesn't think that they can be put in a place like this and nothing will ever happen, they're just really one, one mistake away from getting put in here, so. Without friends, without family, he has to make it on his own. The visit is over. I'll be back on the 26th, and I'll try to get the phone straight around so you can call home, get your TV, okay? Hello. I love you. Hang in there. I will. Get you out of here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just watch your back for me, okay? I will. Be careful. This is the closest to losing a child you can get to. And it doesn't go away. It stays with you. I get to go home to worry about what's going to happen here. Crandall decides to focus on his new life, the one behind bars. Just one hour after his mother leaves, he goes for a tougher look. People that are racist basically like to shave it really, really low, almost skin tight. So I'm not exactly going that low, particularly because of that reason. On the outside, I was known as Scott, and I'm inmate number 508080. Convicts know it's critical to appear confident. But right now, the leader of the Crips is nervous. 
In a few hours, Dyrikis Albert will face his victim's mother and widow. Confronting the consequences of his crime is proving harder than he imagined. I feel it's going to be very emotional and uptight, but I just hope I, I'm going to relax and answer the questions the way she want them, and I hope I give them what they came for. And I just told her... A counselor checks in on him. Be there, because I'm... Oh, man. You'll know what to say, and don't hold that. Yeah, that's the only question I truly don't want to answer is why. That's the one that, that's bothering me. That's what's beating my head up is when she says why. And that's something I... I you know, only you can give her the, the answers, and it's up to her what she does with those answers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There's no turning back now. The gang leader is about to be in a situation that he can't control. As the meeting grows closer, Darikus Albert struggles to keep his composure. The day about basically closure and getting an understanding of the crime I committed. Nervous. I feel a bit nervous. The expression of the family's face when they see me. And how I'm going to say it when I'm going to say it. Just shock. A crazy feeling. His victim's mother is waiting nearby, ready to confront him. I wanted him to know the depths of our pain because it's a pain that a mother cannot really describe and can't put into words. You know, it's like part of her heart has been ripped from her body. My heart is still breaking inside. Six years ago, Albert murdered 27-year-old Albert LaVon Lipford over a drug deal gone bad. Now, he must account for his actions. Shirley Burney lays eyes on her son's killer for the first time. Okay, I'm kind of nervous right now. Mr. Darikis, I'm sitting here writing this letter, trying to put into words how I'm feeling <laughs> with so much agony. I hope you don't mind me calling you by your first name. My son's first name is Albert. I would like to thank you for agreeing to this dialogue with myself and daughter-in-law. Coming here today was so stressful knowing that I would be sitting across from the person who took my son's life. My son Albert knew who he thought he wanted to be in life, but chose a different direction and paid the price. He was never bored. Life was his playground. I sound like a doting mom. <clears throat> Mr. Tyrikis, you and that piece of metal in your hand caused so much havoc I don't think you would ever comprehend the damage you did that November evening. No, Mr. Dyrikis, in closing this letter, I would like to leave this with you. I can't judge you, only God can. I hope you know him. Albert Lavon's Lipford's mom. <laughs> the mother and widow console one another. All Dorikis Albert has to offer is the truth of that night, a story he's never before shared. I had some dope. I had two kilos of dope. I didn't know your son. One of my co-defendants is knowing. The way he kept moving and moving, and I kept shooting and shooting, I'm thinking I'm not hitting. 
but when he hit the little, it was just a little fence. I see he couldn't, you can step over it. And I seen him stagger over it, that's what let me know. Then, Mrs. Bernie asks for something harder to give than just the facts. Well, how did you feel after you'd known that you'd taken a life? I mean, how does, does it feel to take another human's life? I mean, did you think about what you had done? You know, the families, your family? I don't, I don't, I don't think about it because it, it'll get me killed. I can't hide no conscience in the streets. Do you have kids? Yes, ma'am. How many do you have? One. Girl or boy? Boy. Would you want your male child to grow up in your footsteps? You no, know, take the lifestyle you're taking, the path? No, I wouldn't. If it was my choice, I wouldn't want him to. But you do have a choice. I mean, he has the opportunity to, to learn from you, your mistakes. Now, this is no place for anyone to be behind bars and taking another person's life. All they accomplish is grief for both families. I know I can't ask you to forgive me or I can't say I'm Excuse sorry. Excuse me, I want to cut you off right there. I forgave you a long time ago. That was my healing process. So I forgave you. I didn't forgive your act, but I forgave you as a person. It's a gift Albert has no right to expect. I appreciate that. It's good knowing that. But I know I can't say I'm sorry or not. And I wish I could take it back. Just you being here did a lot for her and I both. You know, because you didn't have to agree to this dialogue, but you did, you know. And we both want to thank you for speaking and being here. You take care of yourself, you hear? Seriously. And try to raise that boy of yours. Thank you. The meeting over, Albert heads back to cell block E. Elsewhere in Lebanon, Scott Crandall is growing into his new identity. He ventures out alone at wreck to make new friends. He's aware that there are dangers here and people he needs to avoid. But he knows that for the next seven years, this is the life he's got to live. I went from never getting in trouble before in my life to not, not being around any, any kind of people really to get in trouble. But now I'm constantly around those people every day. And that's who I live with, so gotta deal with it. Alright, we need some clubs. Cell search. Officer Justin Johnson has learned the ropes quickly. Back to the floor, alright. Three months into his new job, he's established his authority. And he's not afraid to use it. Found it in your bed post. You don't know what it is, huh? Right. You did a good job, you found it. Issue a conduct report. And at, the, at first, you know, you really don't know what to expect, so you're not very confident at all. But as every day goes by, you learn more. And you do become more confident. You smoking in here? Sure smells like it. Faces a choice about his future. Knowing what I committed and, and what I did, and for me to accept it and go on, it does a lot for me. When my victim mom shook my hand, I felt like I was going to melt because of seeing her and knowing that I took her son from her, it was my knees, I feel like I was going to buckle. And it made me think about my son and what I was going through. No 
one can say if Dyrikus Albert will make a change, or if his new awareness will fade with time. But one thing is certain. For the foreseeable future, he'll continue to make his way here, in a world divided into predators and prey.